Well, hello everyone. Um, this is Dr. Shirley Caniff here, and welcome to uh, the video version of Faith Talks Live Prayer. Uh, and we do it in conjunction to uh, Faith Talks Live Prayer on um, Blog Talk Radio, as well as um, uh, Vimeo when we do it on video and YouTube and Facebook. Okay. And uh, we're going to uh, do a special segment a special video segment as a segue from the other video that we have put up regarding, um, you know, we're actually addressing a, a need um, that um, people, especially believers who have a relationship with Jesus uh, specifically have experienced from time to time in their walk with the Lord regarding not even, not feeling like, you belong on this planet and feeling you know, human and subhuman. And we, we talked further about that. We unpacked what it really meant and, and how uh, the Lord had actually my prayer time come into my prayer time uh, in the ordinary circumstances of my life on a Sunday morning on the Lord's day uh, to tell me that they, uh, to nudge me and, and say, look, you know, you've been experiencing this all year, you know, throughout for the last 30 years uh, because of some of the, um, you know, the situations and circumstances that I, um, that the enemy had thrown at me uh, when I was younger. And so what happens is sometimes that affects the, um, I would say about 80% of the time, that affects uh, your thinking and um, and your everyday correspondence to uh, God and man in your prayer and also to, uh, yeah, like, like I said, God and man. Um, that includes significant others as well. And so uh, the, the conclusion and the bottom line we came to is that the enemy uh, of your soul wants, it feels like that. And he's projecting his thoughts and he wants you to feel like you're subhuman, you're less than, you don't belong in this planet, you don't belong to anywhere. And so you might as well throw in a towel, towel now and um, end your life right there and then. So, uh, you know, that, that was really um, an eye opener and many people were touched by that. So um, we were a part of a community now uh, where we're um, praying a lot more and holding each other accountable. Um, it's called um, it's called my father's house at Bethel North. So it's it's uh, it will as time goes on, um, our team, our media team, uh, who we live with now, will 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 come on and we will share what God is doing. But I, I'm not going to let I'm not going to let the cat out of the bag just right now because there's some good things coming down the pike, and um, uh, I, I'm back with our friend and colleague uh, Timothy F. O'Leary, who um, really has a, the, the, a, a very he's very gifted in the area of media and broadcasting, um, and as, as well as uh, ministry and talking about the things of God in a way that you would understand. Okay. Um, so anyways, and he's a very powerful prayer warrior, warrior too. But anyways, I want to give, I want to um, uh, approach another t part of this topic. Um, we're still on transition. We're still talking about what goes on in dialogue with the Lord in prayer during transition and what happens in the inner man and what happens in our relationship to other people. And uh, the goal is, is how do we, how can we, um, better solidify that inner dialogue and um, and and make a difference in the world. An inner dialogue that we have with the Lord and with ourselves and and especially during prayer and how we can um, uh, extrapolate that and I'm using a really you know, how can we extend that? How can we extend that into our everyday life to make it to make life better uh, for everyone, to br um, bring the gospel to the four corners of the earth um, in the free flow of the Holy Spirit, okay? So you know where I'm going with this, right? So let's call upon the Holy Spirit right now. Come Holy Spirit, for the hearts of thy faithful and kindle within us the fire of your divine love. Send forth your Holy Spirit and we be, shall be recreated, and they shall be recreated, and I shall be, be re recreated, and you shall renew the face of the earth O oh God, who did instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant that by the gift 
of the same Holy Spirit, that we may be truly wise and to ever rejoice in his consolation. And we pray this to Christ our Lord. Amen. Of course, the Holy Spirit is Jesus' the spirit that he sent to the earth, all right, to um, establish a church and to teach us to be our comfort and consoler and um, our, our, uh, what did I say? I said comfort and consoler, counselor, teacher, and to guide us into all truth of who God is and who we are in him until the day that Jesus comes back a second time to set the kingdom of God, to set his feet into new Jerusalem and to bring the kingdom of God to the earth in power and in glory and in great majesty, okay? Wow, this is wonderful. This is a great thing, way to start a show, don't you think? So anyway, so, so um, today we're going to talk about, all right, and this is coming out of uh, our prayer time in the morning here at Bethel North. Okay, so um, we're going to talk about what the enemy actually whispers in our brain, not to focus in on the enemy, uh, especially when God gives us directives, okay? You know, did you ever wonder, like, why is it that, you know, I hear from God or, you know, and I get these, you know, wonderful thoughts that I know are not mine, and all of a sudden there's this other thinking, you know, you know, we think it's us, but it may it may not be us, especially if we've been doing a lot of work with the Lord and we've been really faithful in our prayer time. If you're Catholic, going to confession, receiving the Eucharist as often as you can, so you can become like Jesus in every in all ways and everything. But so what happens is that in the middle of this, there's that little gray area, that little thing that is like a haunting presence that something is not right. Something is off in Denmark. Something is is way off balance, okay? And um, it's not that the enemy can read your mind. It's that he can project, all right? So I want to get at the gist of the spiritual warfare in our, you know, in, our, um, in this, uh, you know, thing called our brain, our mind between our two ears, okay? And we do have spiritual ears and we do have physical ears, okay? Everything in life, there's always a spiritual component first and foremost. And then it manifests in the, in the, in the physical. That's just the, the law of um, uh, life, okay, on this planet called Earth. So anyways, um, let's see. We are, I want to get to something. I want to I wanna start. Re I'm going to get into a reading, okay? And here's a question. You had the Lord saying, you know, well, let's, let, let me just start by reading um, three, Genesis three. Okay. We're going to go look at, and I just draw, drew something, uh, a schema of what we're going to talk about. But we're going to look at um, Genesis three, um, fall of man and what happened in the falls to understand what's going on with us. And there's my face right there. Uh, and then um, and then we're going to look at Romans five. Uh, death through Adam, life through Christ, to understand this uh, spiritual warfare and why we go through what we go through, okay? And then we're going to look at how Jesus got tempted by the same thing, Jesus, right? Son of God, Son of Man, uh, the temptations of Jesus, uh, Luke 4, and then Romans 6, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the reality, what's going, what, what is the total reality of What's happening now, you know, in 2016 with every believer who receives Jesus as Lord and Savior. And uh, it's all about being dead to sin and alive in Christ. But we're going to delve into the scriptures about what that entails. Okay, so let, let's go right now to Genesis 3. Okay, got your glasses, got your book, got your tea. Um, close my tea is right across the room there. And I definitely do not want to distract anybody but going to get it i have a great setup it took me time to set this up but god is good he's faithful okay so let's flip through genesis 3 and we'll we'll begin to unpack this and and um and see what god says about this and says about you okay he loves you so much okay so here we go genesis 3 and as i was uh, sharing this with our friend tim o'leary who will come on from time to time um he, it was funny, I was like, I was getting this number line about, um, you know, doubt and unbelief. I mean, doubt, doubt, unbelief versus faith and belief. And I, it was this, 
you'll see it in a, co in, in a couple minutes. It's going to be great. All right, so the fall of man, okay, Genesis 3. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say, you know what, I, let me see. Let's go, I want to go back to, let's go to Genesis 2. And then we'll go right into Genesis 3 because you won't understand the whole story of Adam and Eve if we don't start from the beginning, okay? So this is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. When the Lord God made the earth and the heavens and no shrub of the field, yet it appeared, yet um, no shrub had appeared on the earth yet and no plant of the field had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth and there was no man to work the ground, but streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and the man became a living being. Kind of what how we pray for the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is a ruach. He's the breath and he's the spirit. You know, spirit, ruach, breath, one and the same. And he gives life to our mortal bodies, all right? In the spirit first and then physically. It says, now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, Eden, and there he put the man he had formed, and the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river of water in the garden flowed from Eden, Eden, and that from there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is a Pishon, P-I-S-H-O-N. It winds to the entire land of Havilah, the, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic res, resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gishon, G-I-S-H-O-N. It winds to the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of the Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. And this is because they didn't die physically. This is spiritual. Remember, remember these words, spiritual proceeds the physical the lord god said it is not good for man to be alone i will make a help as suitable for him now the lord god had formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air he brought them to man to see what he would name them and whatever the man called each living creature that was its name so the man gave names to all the livestock the birds of the air and all the beasts of the field but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. For she was taken out of a man. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And they will become one flesh. The man and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. So now let's go to Genesis 3. The fall of man. What happened? Okay. What happened with this union? Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals. The Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say? See, that's going to be important because that, I'm going to compare what did God really say. And then later on, when and when God you know, talks to his creation, his man and woman, just a man and woman that he made to um, be there for each other and for the kingdom at, at the time, the, uh, the other question uh, is, where are you, Adam? Okay, so... These are the two questions. I say ontological questions, questions of being, questions that reside deep within the spirit of man every time. Um, atheists stumble upon it. 
scientists stumbled upon it when they used deductive reasons, reasons to, to prove their theory. You know, where are you? And, um, you know, the causes of reflection. And also, um, and then that other question that atheists ask all the time, did God say, did God really say that? Okay. It, the the um, origin of that is in the book, from the book of Genesis, from when the serpent spoke that. And asked, asked that question. So let's go back. Let's go. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Did he really say that? Did you hear right? Did you, did you, did you, are you sure you're hearing from God? Did he really say that? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in a garden, but God did say, you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You know, and I put a little question in that. You know, maybe it was uh, supposed to be for later on. God maybe had that purpose uh, in there for another, you know, had that tree in there for another purpose, okay? Um, because he's God who makes all things. So the woman said to the serpent, we may eat from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit, fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. Do you suppose the enemy ate from that same tree and then pride came into his being? And then when there was that great fallout that happened at the throne where he wanted to be God himself. He wanted to fight God for the throne. And then Michael, Michael the archangel, all right, um, came in. Because he was a, a worship angel at some point called Lucifer, right? So what happened was in that struggle, you know, Michael, God gave Michael the authority to overtake him. Michael said, the angel that guards the throne day and night of God in Israel and Christians who believe. And so what happens is that um, there was a big fall and Satan, you know, and then Lucifer fell from grace and his nature was changed in the twinkling of an eye. And he was hurled to the earth and with, um, with the, uh, being hurled down to the earth, he took what, one third of the, what, there was one third of the angels that were probably once holy angels that also um, had collaborated and cohooted with him, and they fell with him. And when they came down to the earth, there was a cataclysmic event. And it may be, uh, it may, this is not in the scripture, but it may have been the reason why at some point uh, there was, you know, there became an ice age, and, uh, but, you know, there was, um, you know, Things on the planet here called dinosaurs and mammoths, and we were there. And, and these people, these things, they're not people. <laughs> these things are there, thousands, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago. So, uh, millions of years ago. Um, and so, you know, that you know, um, the Earth became a vast wasteland, and, and things like that. And we'll see where that you know that there was a place in the Earth or maybe between heaven and earth, in paradise where uh, Adam and Eve were cast out. But we'll, we'll, we'll read further into that to see what the, the to see the remedy that the Lord gave them, because he did love them. He, he created them. Okay. All right. So the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. You must not touch it or you will surely die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good, she saw that like lust came to her eyes. She saw, all right, when she saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable. So lust and desire for something beautiful came right into her senses. Uh, desirable for great gaining wisdom. She took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, you know, 
oh, try this. This is really cool, you know. I, 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 this is what it really, you know, it really is. You know, you don't have to, you know, listen to what God said because, you know, yeah, this guy, you know, the serpent here said that, you know, we'll be like God, and you know, that's what we want to be like, right? And so that's maybe that's that's how the dialogue went. I would assume, right? That's how it is. Whenever you know people collaborate, and you know whether it be a new idea or with the invention or even sin itself. <laughs> so, anyways, um, she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and she, he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized it was open like this, right? Could you imagine, like? <gasps> You are, you don't have any, do you know you don't have any clothes on? <laughs> you know, the eyes are open. They, they realize they were naked, right? So then the eyes of both of them were open and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves, must have been real big fig leaves, <laughs> um, together and made coverings for themselves. This is the Dr. Shrove version of um, the book of Genesis. I hope you're liking it. <laughs> then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden, in the cool of the day, all right? And they hid from him. They hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? You know, he, he does that to us a lot. But we, we, we claim, some people, when they know that people, some people hear more from God than others, they're like, well, how come I don't hear from God? Well, maybe God's talking to you, asking you, where are you? Where is your perspective? Where are you in life? You know, and, and that, what have you done? What are you doing? What are you about? You know, are you going to receive me? Where are you spiritually? Where are you? Okay. Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate it. Okay. So the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust. All right. And all the days of your life, I will put enmity between you and the woman between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head. This is the offspring. This is Jesus. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains and childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to children. And also, I'm going to add this because I'm a grandmother now. And with pain, you will raise them. And, you, you know, you, you will go through the pain of, you know, having your children turn on you when they're teenagers, only for a temporary moment because they have amnesia. And everything you, you know, have um, taught them <laughs> spiritually when they were growing up, they will return back to that. That's what it says in uh, another part of scripture in the book of Psalms. But, you know, only after their time of testing and, 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 and tribulation. Okay. So this is not the time to throw their towel in. Not the time to end life. It's not the time to end relationships. It's the time to pray. And so... Um, that's this is this is uh, this is why we go through what we go through. Okay, um, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing and child rearing. Uh, with pain, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. So, ladies, if you think you have a control and mate, guess what? It's it's uh, it's the way that it is. So, you, and if you if you're living in a hard situation, you need to um, consult with the Lord on it who made heaven and earth, and he will. And if your husband's, well, even if it's not following the Lord, the Lord will give you remedy, and the Lord will make it things easier and more bearable, and it may, it may even give you wisdom for your situation and circumstances. In my circumstances and situations of life, um, in e e life eons ago in my, in my past, um, that's what happened to me. I'll share that with you in other um uh, broadcast okay so uh so anyways so to adam he said because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree of, about which i commanded you you must not eat of it curse it is ground because of you through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life you will work you will go to work 
and make a living. It will produce thorns and thistles. It will be hard for you at times. And you will eat the plants of the, of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food. Until you return to the ground, since from where you were, were taken, for dust you are, you are, and to dust you will return. So Adam named his wife Eve because she would become the mother of all the living. All right. So, so back to the question. And I'm just going to back up so we can see the, uh, the board. So I drew a number line. Uh, you know, one, I should probably put eight over here. Yeah, maybe that's what I'll do. Okay, eight, just to make it even. Okay, minus eight. And then it, and, and here is absolute zero, and I cut, I put Jesus here, the divine mercy picture of Jesus, so, because he's, Jesus, Jesus is, you know, he's, he died for our sins, he rose from the dead. And, you know, he's all about the work of mercy and bringing people to the cross, bringing people to the end of themselves, and then bringing people into um, uh, to the Holy Spirit, his spirit um, that he sends from heaven to the earth to bring you into all truth, okay, of who you are. Because God's, because it's not time for people to be condemned to hell. That is for, uh, hell is for Satan and his demons. But what happens is that um, the enemy could try to persuade people through massive movements, you know, you know, um, through television shows called Lucifer, or, um, through, um, you know, the, you know, Illuminati, through Satanists, through anything that is an antithesis to the things of God. Okay, so we have God on the positive side. This is like a, this is a number line where you have all the positive integers. Uh, from um, absolute zero all the way uh, to, you know, infinity. And you also have the negative side, you know, everything that's based on subtraction and, and not multiplying, you know, not multiplying, not adding anything, but just taking away, right? So um, so I see that this, this is the God side and this is Satan's side, all right? God side is faith and belief. Satan's side is doubt and unbelief. Um, the question that God asks in your relationship with him all the time is check. It's a checkpoint is where are you? Okay. And then on this side, uh, the enemy, when God starts speaking to you, um, you know, and so you can get your directors from the Lord. All of a sudden the enemy comes in there with doubt, with doubt. Okay. And says, did God really say, did God really say, okay. And you hear this, like I said earlier, in the conversations that atheists are all, you know, are always posing when it comes to um, this, they they call it a critical evaluation of, um, of, of, you know, of Jesus. And, you know, did this man really exist? Is he son of God, son of man, or is he uh, historical? So, um, which makes us what hysterical. <laughs> but anyways, that's just, you know, Dr. Shirley. Let's get back to business. All right. So I read from Genesis, and you see the origin of um, where these questions arise from, you know, and 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 how you know, and 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 what the plan of the enemy was. And I would just want to further go into this by saying also that that's why he he likes to go into the feeling realm. He wants you to get. He wants you to believe what he's projecting, because he's in a place of you know, despair because all he wants, all he wanted to do is, is take over the throne of God and win people to himself. But, you know, I'm sure he's very lonely in hell. I'm very sure there's a lot more people in purgatory than hell. I can tell you that. And the thing is, he's, he's, set, he's trying to set up some kind of kingdom for where he is, but it's not going to happen because Jesus died for our sins. He did it all. He did it all in his blood. His blood is available for anybody who calls upon his name. Okay, so that's the reality behind that. Um, one of the things that um, when John Paul Jackson, the late John Paul Jackson, uh, taught when he was alive, and you can get this on his teachings at Streams Ministry, uh, that um, uh, when the, oh the difference between belief and unbelief, unbelief is like this um, black hole. It's subtraction. It's like the, it's the, and and um, in 
and just think about belief as adding to adding add into your life. I'm not saying exactly like he he did, but you know, you get the gist that it's you know, I believe it's just um when you're, you know, about ready to lay hands and there are people in the room, it's, you know, it, it subtracts from the overall consensus of faith in, in, in people that, you know, are called to pray in a situation where, you know, it's going to require a tremendous amount of faith and because faith is a substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things seen. But if there's some darkness in there and unbelief, it's going to subtract. It's going to, um, uh, even though the light out, does outshine the darkness, uh, it, it'll temporarily block what God wants to do in, in that given moment. That's why when Jesus, before Jesus healed people, uh, he always sent pe certain people out of the room. It's because they, he knew, he knew in the spirit that they were operating in, in um, doubt and unbelief, and it was not going to be conducive to the situation at hand, which was for healing and resurrection, you know, the big miracles. Okay. So I just, just want to put that in your, that, that little nugget in your spirit. So let's go back to um, the um, the board here. So you know we have Jesus. He's an over and a maker, beginning of all things. You know, absolute. You know, he's he's the one that holds everything together, right? Um, the beginning and ending of all things. All right. So now we're going to look at Romans five, um, uh, and uh, you know, and and what the purpose of Adam was and what the purpose of Jesus is, um, Romans 6, okay, Romans 5 and Romans 6. In the New Testament, but before that, yeah, Romans 5, Romans 6, no, I'm sorry, let's, let's do that afterwards, but let's go to how Jesus was tempted, yes, Luke 4, because it, you'll see, I mean, we, we, we you, you saw from what happened in the Garden of Eden, and now Jesus, um, before he goes to the cross and after he was baptized, he was put to the test. Just like um, our, our, our forefathers, uh, our, our first mother and father, Adam and Eve. Okay. We just talked about that. So let's go to, what did I say? Luke 4. For those who... Or having a hard time knowing what that is. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Luke is the third book. Luke 4. I'm sure you're not having a hard time because you're always in the Word all the time, right? <laughs> I hope so. Dr. Joe, I hope so. Anyways, let's go. All right. So let's uh, come up to the mic here. Let's get, get Jesus in the picture. There he goes. All right. I love when Jesus is in the picture, don't you? Okay, the temptation of Jesus. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert. He had just received baptism from John. Where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place. And you probably tried to interject pride and whatever arsenal, you know, tools was in his arsenals. Um, maybe it's from that tree he ate way, way back when, right? It says, the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the, kings of the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all the authority and splendor for it has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. This is, this is, these are the words of Jesus. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here for it is written. See, he, he tried to get him to commit suicide. See? See what the Lord, see what that enemy does? See what he does? Think about that. All right. Um, especially he tries to abort God's plan in, in our, you know, in projecting his thoughts from hell, wherever he is, to us. And, uh, you know, we, and we, we need to always, always 
ask for the mind of Christ. All right, turn it over, turn those thoughts over to Jesus and ask for his mind. And he will give it to you. I guarantee it. So, so devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, even, even the enemy will throw scripture because he wants to be God, right? He knows the scriptures as well, but he'll use it as an antithesis against what God wants for the person's life right there and then. He will command his angels concerning you to guide you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, he, it says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all of this kind of tempting, he left him until an opportune time. And then again, he tried to um, come at him again, um, throwing fear at him in the garden of Gethsemane before he went to the cross to die for our sins. And and then he jeered. He was used. He was part of the, the jeering of the crowd when they um, insisted that Jesus be crucified instead of releasing. Um, and, and said they wanted to release a murderer of all people, Barabbas, uh, and then um, send Jesus to the cross in Barabbas's place. So, you know, you know, he was he was working the crowd so that that day and and things like that. And he's always trying to work the crowd. So anyway, so that is um, the temptation of Jesus, and and you know, see, I, I just want you to see how this all connects together. This is all, we're all in this together. Um, if Jesus went through it, we we have to go through something like this, but we don't have to give in totally like he didn't. But you know, we we want to talk about, we want to quote the same scriptures that Jesus did. These these, these scriptures have merit. These scriptures have power. Um, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Jesus answered in another instance when he um, you know, insisted that he will be in charge of all the kingdoms of the world. Jesus knows the beginning from the end. He knows when that will happen, but the enemy wanted it there and then. It says, do not put the Lord your God to the test. All right. And we can say the same thing, too. All right. So, um, so let's go to um, now we'll go to Romans 5. In Romans 6, to confirm what I'm telling you, what Dr. Cheryl's telling you about the purpose, all right, of why Jesus came and how he um, wrestled with the enemy and what is to be expected uh, in the new man creation, okay? So let's go to Romans 5, and then we'll go to Romans 6. Romans 5, all right. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through him, whom we have gained access by faith into his grace in which we now stand. And we, <laughs> and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. And there's, there's the, the buzzword, suffering produces perseverance. I wish I had more room on the board. Uh, and uh, let's see. And perseverance produces character. And character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, whom he has given to us. You see, just the right time when you were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God and from, I'm sorry, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him. For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, Jesus Christ, how much more having been reconciled shall we be saved through his life, through his resurrected life? Not only is this so, but we also re rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, 
to whom we have now received reconciliation. And out of all the books that I've read so far, and there's much more books for me to read, because I'm studying medicine right, right now, but of all the things I've looked at, of all the things that, um, of all the people, of all leaders that I've read, no one has ever died for the salvation of man and came back from the dead uh, and, and, and given us his resurrection power through, a body, through the body called the church on earth, the church of Jesus Christ, through the Catholics and through these other churches and groups and communities of faith um, over centuries, over thousands of years. All right, so death through Adam, life through Christ. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, Adam, and death through sin, and in this way death came to all men because all had sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, for before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. But the gift is not like the trespass, for if the many died for the trespass of the one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. Again, the gift of God is not like the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift, which is Jesus, followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of the one man, Adam, death reigned through that one man, Adam, how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ? Consequently, just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification. That brings life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Through his blood. The law was added so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also grace might reign through righteousness, through the righteous life of Jesus Christ, to bring eternal life through Jesus, through his through his his love, through his life for you, his love for you and his life. All right, so let's go to Romans 6. Dead to sin and alive in Christ. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means, says Apostle Paul. We die to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Because, see, there's a power. It's not just what Jesus did. It's the power of what his blood is, has brought us when we receive Jesus through baptism. It's the power. We die to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized unto his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that Jesus, as in order, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life, a new creation. If we have been united with him like this in his death, we will certainly also be united with him in his resurrection. But we know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves to sin. Because anyone who has died has been freed from sin. Now, if we die with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him for we know that since, since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot die again. Death no longer has mastery over him or over you. It just when people fall, when people die, it appears with our physical eyes, um, die on, on this earth, where they're actually sleeping in Christ until he wakes them up again for the second throne, death, white throne judgment. Um, so, for we know that since Christ was raised from the dead, he cannot 
die again, death no longer has mastery over him. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives in God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies so that you may obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been through, I'm sorry, as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness, for sin shall not be your master any longer because you are not under law, but under grace. So we are slaves to righteousness. Okay. And therefore there is no condemnation uh, for those who are in Christ Jesus. And, uh, you know, it says in John um, 10.27 too, whenever that voice comes at you, remember this, okay? Now that you know you have been brought, you have been bought, with the price of Christ, through the blood of Jesus, and that your own man nature is constantly, constantly dying as you come into the newness of who you are in Christ Jesus. Um, so let's go to, you know, this is the last scripture for this evening, uh, John 10, 27. I'm looking over my shoulder at the piece of paper. So I'm, I'm trying to keep myself accountable so that I don't read you the wrong scripture for today. Let's see, um, John 10.27. Ah. Okay, what's that? John 10.27. Oh, 10. I'm looking at 6. See? It's good to write these things down. 10.27. All right, here we go. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Jesus answered, okay, let's let's go back to the unbelief. Yeah, so the unbelief of the Jews. We're talking about the unbelief, right? Um, then came the feast of the dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple area walking in Solomon's colonnade. colonnade. The Jews gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe the miracles I do in my father's name speak for me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I will give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. So there it is. Words of Jesus. No one who Jesus has in the palm of his hands can be snatched out. And that is the gist of this whole conversation that we've had from the last video to this video. When the enemy makes you feel, projects into your brain, into your mind. All right, He wants to get to your spirit, but he can't if Jesus has you. But into your mindset that you are a subhuman, you, you know, there's no place on earth for you. You know, you might as well throw in a towel right now. Nobody loves you. Everybody hates you. Go out and eat some worms. You know, even worms won't, won't like you, you know, going down your throat. You see what, you, you know, all that stuff, you know, that's not the, um, the voice of the, um, the Lord. It's the voice of the enemy projecting his position from a very low position that he occupies. He's, he's envious of you. He wants to know. He wants to be the, in the place that you are in right now. So he wants to. He's a thief, and he wants to come and rob you of a, of the of of the life that Jesus wants to give you, only because he loves you. So, Father, we just thank you, Jesus. We thank you for um, what you did, who you are, and what you did for mankind. And Lord, we, we ask for a greater outpouring of your Holy Spirit to fall upon those who um, are, you know, called to watch this broadcast and to be filled with your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. She got a Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Love on your people. Fill your people with 
You are healing love, you're healing power, you're healing joy, and your peace, your shalom, your blanket of shalom right now. I just see this blanket of shalom of God's peace is coming over, over everyone right now who, who's listened to this broadcast. You know, the Lord really loves you. And he wants, he's willing all good things for you from heaven. And I, you know what, you're asking, well, how, well, how do you know this, Dr. Shirley? Well, he left a treasury, uh, you know, called the Our Father, the Lord's Prayer, from, from um, the book of John in the New Testament, calling upon his will to come into your life um, from heaven, uh, you know, come into your life on, uh, on the earth from heaven. Okay, as is as it is in heaven. So let's let's um let's end this um wonderful heart revealing, God inspiring video with an our Father for your life. Okay, you will never be the same again. Our Father who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, Lord. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. Give your people this day your daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses. And them are their trespassers, as we forgive those, and they forgive those who trespass against us and them, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. And God bless you. Until next time, peace and blessings. Bye-bye. Love you.